All right. We got enough people here. Uh, we'll talk about uh, chapters 9 and 10, where we learn about Tonglin. Did I say the word right? Probably not. <laughs> Probably well, I not. Were, you were in the ballpark. You were close enough. I'm close enough. That's, I'll take it. Uh, oh, goodness. Oh, that's like a whole thing with my students. I live in an urban, you know, an urban large city. And so uh, we'll just say my student population has quite the variety of names. Quite the variety. And the number of times I get corrected for my mispronunciations is astounding. I even try to write them down phonetically on my roll sheet to help. <laughs> and I will still manage to mispronounce them sometimes, and I feel real bad, but it's hard. Um, so, this fancy Tibetan word, sending and taking. Uh, oh, my highlighter's not on. Do, 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 do. It refers to being willing to take in the pain and suffering of ourselves and others to send out happiness to us all. Um, what be and then she kind of goes into what ends up being an instructional on this uh, breathing practice, where on the in breath you you'll take in like this pain and. Uh, the suffering, and then on the out breath, you're trying to send out like the good vibes. She doesn't say good vibes. Uh, a sincere wish that we ha and others could be free of suffering, is what she she says. Here it is. We breathe in what is painful and unwanted with the sincere wish that we and others could be free of suffering. <laughs> yes, good vibes is now an official Dharma term. Uh, I noticed a lot of y'all muted. Y'all are welcome to talk and stop me at any moment. <laughs> this isn't just Des does a lecture for an hour <laughs> time. Like, I don't feel like I should interrupt you with my my jokes. I think I should just <laughs> let you talk about the book. <laughs> no, no, jokes are fine. <laughs> okay. Interrupt her with jokes. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I'm having breakfast right now, so I don't want my chewing noises and swallowing of coffee noises to be the, the focus of Sangha. So. You don't want to add that ASMR element to the book club recording? I am not a person who does ASMR <laughs> or like to listen to it, but Gregory is. And so the number of times I've walked downstairs while he's still sleeping and his phone is like got some kind of weird chewing noise coming out of <laughs> Oh, God. I just wanted to take his phone and throw it outside. <laughs> oh, goodness, because I'll tell you, I... so far, no amount of meditation has made me capable of handling certain noises. I mean, that's a thing. That's a thing. You, you can't necessarily do something about some things, uh, at least of, of the initial uh, oh. feeling. I congratulate you on not throwing uh, his phone out. <laughs> <laughs> or, or there'll be like this chick like just whispering straight up in a phone like hop, 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 or something and I'm just like I don't know why this helps you sleep I don't understand so first we need to extend compassion to the people who produce ASMR content <laughs> no. No. I will say it's the content no that itself that makes me mad to them themselves I feel they are some of my neutral people I, I could put the creators themselves in my neutral zone. Okay, that's good. <laughs> it's their creations that I despise. <laughs> if Buddha were alive today, Cell, I think you're right, and Buddha would totally use good vibes in, in a sentence. Um, I think I, I think Buddha would use the phrase good vibes can you imagine do you think okay tangent guys while we <laughs> tangent uh do you think a modern like okay buddhism is a thing we got buddha showing up on the scene gonna do the buddha things bring enlightenment to the world do you think they would talk like a gen zer oh i, I mean, mean if they were of that generation then probably some right yeah product of your environment kind of a thing. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. 
Um, okay, so back on task uh, in the chapter. Pema uh, talks about this willingness to stay in the moment with the uncomfortable energy, which I know, uh, obviously, I th nobody really wants to sit with their discomfort, right? Nobody was just like, here, let me just... I say that, and I think my anxiety and my depression will trick me into doing it. I don't want to say I want to do it, right? I'll just do it. <laughs> I'll sit in the anxiety storm instead of, uh, you know... I, and I don't think that's productive. And I think that's maybe worth considering is that when she talks about staying with uncomfortable energy, that doesn't mean <laughs> drown in it. That doesn't mean fixate on it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think maybe that's an important clarification so that you're not... <sighs> How do I put this in a way that makes sense? I am tapering off some meds this week <laughs> and my brain <laughs> is not fully here. Um, anyway, so this is this idea of there's a difference between sitting and staying with it for a moment versus darkness, no parents, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like just really doom and gloom in it up real good. Um, so you, you, you learn not to fear it, but instead, I guess, recognize it. Yeah. Would be a good way of saying that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to avoid it, but you also don't want to just <laughs> submerge yourself in it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Apparently, um, Tonglin has four stages. Tonglin. So, um, oop, I skipped a page. And, no, no, I didn't. <laughs> uh, so apparently, the first, you know, step one, brief moment of stillness. You open up. Excellent. Second stage, visualize. We work with texture and raw energy, claustrophobia and spaciousness. Third stage, which is the essence of the project, as Pema puts it. Breathing in whatever is unwanted and breathing out a sense of relief. This is what I mentioned earlier, where you're like, you breathe in that the hard feelings and then you breathe out the uh, more desired and positive and the, and the openness and the, and so that with that fourth stage, we, you, you, then you can start expanding your compassion further and include these people and hope that they have the experience of those feelings of that freedom from suffering. Uh, she even says you can combine stage three and four, which to me makes sense because they feel like they are the same stage. Yeah. So number nine brings it. Uh, chapter nine is bringing us yet another how to from Pema children. Ch ch -chon, ch children. Ch children. Wow. Co -co you could. We could probably look it up real quick if you wanted, or we can. <laughs> Well, either way. <laughs> or you can keep taking stabs at it. <laughs> Just sit here and butcher her name for an hour. <laughs> uh, so, um, she was talking. She she does stop. She like talks about the stages, and then she does come back to try to describe the first stage, and she gives it a fancy word uh, that I assume is the original word of how what where is it i have lost it i was just looking at it shunyata <laughs> um or let's see it's right here i'm gonna change my color because i want to right here bam now you can see it too uh, and it's this experienced on an emotional level she calls it difficult to describe so i think it would require more reflection and time spent maybe actually attempting it to fully understand if we relax our mind and stop struggling, emotions can move through us without becoming solid and proliferating. And this kind of goes back to how I was saying don't submerge yourself in your bad feelings, right? Um, I think it's this let the emotion move through you, let it approach. As she puts it over and over in the book, stop being afraid of it. 
and there they are. But don't let them become solid and proliferate, which is also mm -hmm. a fun vocab word. I need to get out of the habit of saying that. That's what I do during class. Because <laughs> 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 the students, my students are woefully uninformed of vocabulary words. They are not a well group. Um, some of them are. There, are, There's like one group of students who is pretty high on the vocabulary skills list. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, my students are like, what does that word mean? Yeah. Yes. I think we all know what the word proliferate means, but you know, maybe we should start having song of vocab tests. There's enough random words. That we can <laughs> talk. I absolutely proliferate that kind of approach to this. I think. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Sounds uncomfortable to proliferate that, but okay. <laughs> Um, so I liked this little paragraph overall, and then I liked how she ended it, so I highlighted that part. Um, she talks about the openness that we're trying to experience, right? That is kind of the key to this big, big idea of loving kindness that we're trying to get to as mm -hmm. part of, uh, as, as Pema calls us in the, throughout the book, warrior bodhi, bodhisattvas, warrior bodhisattvas, um, she describes the energy as being dynamic and graspable, always in a state of flux. Our training is to notice how we block or freeze the energy, and we tense up our bodies and minds. Then we train in softening, relaxing, and opening to the energy without interpretations or judgments. So, I like that. I don't know. I like that whole paragraph. I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. Um trust in the living quality of basic energy what a what an exciting concept this is this is des talks a lot time <laughs> we're all we're all here to support you des you're doing great <laughs> <laughs> why do you guys let me lead this i'm so bad at it <laughs> you're doing great keep going keep going yay. keep going <laughs> um yeah and i just enjoy her continued exploration of like these flat uh what flashing openness is supposed to feel like and then she guides us through these steps and really describes the experience you know and as i've expressed many a time and even already expressed today i really like how in depth she makes it feel that she's gone into this process for us as readers because so many books just make me feel like I have missed out somehow because mm -hmm. I don't some books, <laughs> some books they feel like they read the books the books they were supposed to read but they never actually felt them themselves yeah the way she says this is it makes me feel like she knows what she's talking about yeah it feels like she has first-hand ex experience and she's also a good teacher you know, she she knows how to take that experience and bring it down to the, bring it to the level that we can understand. Yes. Yeah. It takes her a bit, but then over here she gets to the second stage of Tonglin. Um, she talks about breathing in qualities of claustrophobia, which I can immediately feel in my body going no. <laughs> I don't want to do that. That sounds awful. <laughs> as as somebody who has had some bad experiences with claustrophobia, that sounds like a bad time. <laughs> but then we breathe out the qualities of spaciousness. And so I thought this was a very interesting uh, juxt not juxtaposition, um, contrast. Yeah, these two things contrast very nicely for the point she's making. One's thick, heavy, and hot, and you're like, so you're breathing in these uncomfortable qualities, and then when you're breathing out and try to send that energy to someone you want um, to have that sort of freedom from suffering, it's light, it's fresh, and it's cool in, in comparison. It's easy, breezy, beautiful cover, girl. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you can tell. I, I could see that working as a weird mantra. <laughs> I don't <know. laughs> 
<laughs> Please don't use corporate slogans as mantras. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I want. You can't stop me. <laughs> Aaron, I just do it. do it. Just do it. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> Can you imagine intentionally trying to lead an entire meditation sit, like with people and you keep using slogans <laughs> and you're just waiting for someone to call you out? I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm just loving it. Uh, your way. <laughs> just the whole time. And people are like, dude, are they doing that on purpose? Mm-hmm. Always fresh. You know when it's real. <laughs> we have the meat. Wait. <laughs> That's where I think they're going to realize you're trolling them. Uh- <laughs> you're like, man, I paid $40 for this. <laughs> Why did I pay? This is a weird. What's going on? <laughs> well, it can be a kid. So, oh, oh, no, you scrolled past it. I was going to say the visualizing of. The way she visualizes things, I think, is really interesting. And I think that's what stuck out to me through these chapters is Mm -hmm. um, she's got the bit where she talks about the first time she experienced Shinyata was um, the fan going off. Yeah. But also things like tying it to these abstractions, like claustrophobia being this yellow smog that we're exhaling Mm -hmm. or that we are inhaling. Um. I think that can be useful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when she doesn't have a like one to one comparison with reality, giving you something to visualize to tie it to, I think that's a useful tool. Yeah, I agree. One thing that I like about uh, the process outlined here is it's <laughs> without getting a little bit too like, <laughs> I-, I don't know. Uh, wooey self-helpy which Mm -hmm. i would say this is the kind of thing the book's really good at avoiding even though it would otherwise be squarely in that category Mm -hmm. (laughs) um there is i think something for lack of a better word empowering about it that the process this process of of practicing compassion and like certain attitudes in this way is one where you are breathing in something unpleasant and transforming it into something better Mm -hmm. I think that that's probably a pretty good mindset um, to inhabit for a while. Absolutely. Um, I frequently am always a big, I I always really enjoy when I feel like Buddhism has hit on behavioral, like cognitive behavioral therapy long before it became officially a thing. (laughs) Or maybe how these two things, at least in modern iterations, like books like this, have maybe grown together. Um, Mm -hmm. And it almost is... I want to go with reassuring. Because I know this one form of therapy works really well, has a lot of validity to it, and then I come over to this practice, and it feels validated because it shares so much of like taking you through this healthy process of mm-hmm. going from being filled with your anxieties to how do I express more love and kindness I would not be surprised to learn that um, the psychologists that developed CBT were coming from a Buddhist framework Mm -hmm. Uh, that's really common in therapy and I I can see what you're saying so yeah that wouldn't be surprising to me I'm just gonna look it up real quick (laughs) Avery (laughs) being being on top of it (laughs) what if I answered my own questions instead of speculating into into the night I don't know (laughs) Uh, then you would be lecturing (laughs) CBT is inspired particularly by stoicism so well, that makes sense we, too yeah maybe have you ever a stoic text well, for a book club because that could be kind of fun that could be fun Let's stoicism do it. is like kind of buddhist nature it's just like the greek version of <laughs> kind of at least when i researched about it 
Yeah. So yeah, maybe we should do a stoic text. I made a note. <laughs> okay. Quiet. I bet. I bet Das is writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> well, if not I don't, I'll forget. <laughs> not. <laughs> not any of the original Stoic texts. Like, let's get something modern that's easy to like do. Yeah, yeah. Modern, modern versions of things like the me meditation. Stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't want another experience of reading through the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to read Marcus Aurelius. I do not. I refuse. Okay. What? Okay. All right. Okay. Anyway. I guess. Marcus Aurelius is the best, though. No, I mean, it, Meditations is weird because it's not a book that he wrote for people. It's just, it's just, a, it's his diary. Well, it's his diary. To be a people. Huh? I happen to be a people. So damn. Yeah, uh, um, I'm sure there's something more accessible that we could read um, and more directed. I'm sure there's modern stoic texts. Anyway, let's let's talk about the current book. I guess. Um. Um. So, going back to this idea of where we start, where it's easy, she ends this particular section of the chapter by going, "The point is to use whatever works." <laughs> And to summarize, like, how do we get into the steps? How do we clear our emotions, clear the air? How do we um, get from A to B? And she gives us a bunch of examples and a couple little stories. And, and I love that she's just like, just use whatever works. Like, is XYZ working for you? You're doing it. <laughs> um, and I like that. It, it makes me feel better. <laughs> And maybe I'm attached to something, and that's why I feel better. But here we go. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, then she comes down. Let's see. Where is it? If we are doing Toglin for with our own pain, we always remember those who have similar anguish and include them as we breathe in and out. In other words, we start with something particular and genuine and then widen the circle as far as we can. So she, she just hits this point over and over and over again, which I think is good the way she does it, because it really starts to st stick in my head, uh, at least, of start with the thing that you relate to and then widen out. Don't don't try to start over there where you're angry. Start over here. I, I think here, and I don't remember if she gets into this, but like there's this very particular utility to... Um, bearing in mind others who have similar anguish because when you are going through it, it can be easy to forget that other people are going through it as well. Um, yes. yes, it is. And, you know, that can cause you to lash out at people mm -hmm. undeservedly. That can, like, there's a direct utility there that I think is interesting. Well, as and I've joked about this in conversations, people, you get into the like, mine is the worst of all fates mentality, right? Like the soul of no one knows what it's like to be me. No uh, one knows what, what it's like, like to be a sad death. I know. No one does. And that can absolutely interfere with the compassion, just like you said. You lash out, <laughs> you you forget that, you know, hey, they might be going through something, too. Um, I'm going to skip just a bit of this chapter to jump over here. Ah, show coming in and out. Um, so, Tonglin begins to ventilate our prejudices and introduce us to a more tender and open-minded world. Yes. Yeah, so uh, she she recommends overall that this is kind of an on-the-spot practice that at any time, you know, during your day where you find yourself, you can just try to, you know, breathe in these difficult things and breathe out the the desire for the end of suffering, pretty much, you know? And this is, this is a good thing, I think. Um, 
I I didn't have a word for it, but I have been until I read these chapters, but I was kind of doing it with some of my classes with the students. I take a deep I didn't do it quite as intentionally, right? But a, taking a big deep breath, my aggravation, my frustration with the students and how what I felt was an inappropriate attitude and trying to breathe out this desire for them to grow into healthy, well-adjusted adults, <laughs> you know? And mm -hmm. so, uh, as she'll later say in chapter 10, uh, <laughs> difficult people are our greatest teachers and <laughs> my students mm -hmm. are trying to teach me so much. So, as I continue to work on my internal narrative regarding my students. <laughs> I've been talking with uh, Gregory about this a bit. I was like, if I could just change the way I talk to myself about some of my students, I think it would solve a lot of my, like, problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So chapter 10, we skipped a little bit of chapter nine, but we're trying to double up on chapters. And uh, so let's jump into chapter 10 a bit. And this chapter is finding the ability to rejoice. We got a cute little, little quote here by someone whose name I can't pronounce. <laughs> Long Chinpa? Yeah, that's Long Chin probably... Chin Chinpa, yeah. Chinpa? That's probably Long close enough, right? Chinpa. Let the flower of compassion blossom in the rich soil of my yitri, and water it with the good water of equanimity in the cool, refreshing shade of joy. Which is a this is a fun little mentality, like little men mental image. I like anything that uses this idea of like watering plants. This is usually a good time for my brain. It has a good time with this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, plants. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, talking about these these practices, she'll hit a little bit back on a couple of the same concepts we'll carry from last chapter into this chapter, except she's going to tell us about a whole new set of stages and steps and practice that we can do. Uh, there's a, We are really hitting the how-tos in this book. Uh, this book is really starting to be like, and here's how you do this, and here's how you do this. <laughs> Did you want to know how to do this? Too bad, I'm telling you. Um... So one of the things she starts with that I liked was this trust in our fresh, unbiased nature brings us unlimited joy, a happiness that's completely devoid of clinging and craving. This is the joy of happiness without a hangover. <laughs> Which I thought that was fun. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so when we go into these practices, and that was interesting to me to really consider what types of joy give me a hangover <laughs> <laughs> uh, versus you know, just being, having a good time kind of thing. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't think this is at all what she means, but in my mind, my first immediate thought was how sometimes I find certain simu st situations, while ultimately enjoyable, really overstimulating, and they make me want to take a nap immediately. <laughs> Versus some situations that I find like, I'm kind of refreshed and I could I could keep going. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think that's quite what it is, but I'm going to try. To, I'm personally going to try to find a way to maybe use that as a um, a springboard for understanding, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I'm going to work on that personally. That's desk goals. Mm -hmm. um, so she talks about how do we cultivate these things, these conditions for the, you know, the joy to expand. She talks about that mindfulness. Um, remember, you guys can interrupt me at any time, especially when you're sick of listening to me talk. Well, well then you should take our lack of interruptions. It's just, we're enraptured. Please keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's enraptured when I talk. <laughs> I barely sound like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh... <laughs> uh... <laughs> no less than any of us. And here we are, are some plants again as we cultivate our garden. Uh, the conditions become more conducive to the growth of bodhicitta. 
So I like that. Mm -hmm. Like me some good plant metaphors. Big fan. That's your primary um, metric when reviewing a book is how many plant metaphors were there? <laughs> Once again, this is why nobody will publish me or my critiques or reviews or anything. I'll publish you. My husband has come to inform me that he will uh, support my, my publishing desires. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it just briefly came in and said I'll publish you and then walked away <laughs> anyway uh, so she calls this a seven step aspiration practice and then gets into the step by steps of it um, and then so that's very interesting if you want to learn innate real good some <laughs> Some steps uh, for the and awakening. Who amongst us does not want to learn innate? Who amongst us, indeed? Oh, I, I, for one, proliferate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm, good shit. This is a good time. Anyway, so... Um... As the Awakening Warrior, that is us. We are the Awakening Warriors, by the way, if you didn't know that. Uh, here are our steps. And also, she takes a moment to say, what a good time if you've got a spiritual buddy who can hang out with you and help guide you. Unfortunately, none of us have those. So No. I hate everyone here. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, me too. Yeah, you guys stink. I assume. <laughs> you meant it literally, not in like a, a metal. Okay. <laughs> I am both too far away and I have a stuffy nose, so. <laughs> That's not going to stop me eventually. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Anyway. <laughs> Step one. <laughs> Learn to rejoice in our own good fortune. So here she is again doing that, what I love, of start where it's easy, right? We're mm -hmm. like, oh, man, I'm doing great. Look at these great things going on in my life. I've got food. I've got water. I have a bed. Um, these are the things I have to remind myself of sometimes when the panic begins to come to the edges of my consciousness and the anxiety wants to win. Uh <laughs> I have to like mm -hmm. go over all the things that I have that are working out and not the things that could go wrong or hypothetically might go wrong. Yeah. That's a hard time. Mm -hmm. uh, fully connect with this moment, guys. Can you believe it? Buddhism recommending being in the moment? Wild. <laughs> ah. Um. Do, do, do. What was the next point I thought? Hold up. There's a list of items that caught my attention just now. Um, All right. By taking ordinary things, our pots and pans, our clothing, our teeth. <laughs> we rejoice in them. That's right, um, Avery. So, yeah. I I feel like one of these things is not like the other, but I do. <laughs> <agree>. <laughs> so, I just... I feel like she specifically is coming for people like us. When she includes teeth. I won't lie. Losing my teeth is a real anxiety issue I have. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to be grateful that I have them still. Mm -hmm. Oh. That's a real fear of losing my teeth my, mm -hmm. in my brain. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. I think one thing I will say that I legitimately like about this bit and the immediate next bit, bit when we scrub a vegetable or brush our hair is that it is uh, putting parts of our body in the same thing, like in the same conceptual bucket as not things that are not part of our body. Yeah. It's pretty valuable. Yeah. Or. Or. Oh, okay. Shoot. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm ready. <laughs> Scrubbing a vegetable is a really weird idiom. <laughs> uh, this is actually referring to your new job volunteering at the hospital, helping comatose patients. Oh, no! <laughs> uh, okay. I here? think she, literally. I'm going out on a limb here and saying that we should interpret this part. Very literally. <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. 
means you're in the kitchen about to eat some veggies and you're scrubbing them. And maybe Please. it's a hobby of yours. Maybe you go out in the garden. And... <laughs> Just scrub the vegetables while they're still on the vine. But then yeah. you're like, they gotta be clean. I take baths, eat in showers, you know, like every day or so. Um, so, <laughs> so do I. Way. Wow. The vegetables also deserve a daily hygiene. Okay, sorry. Please. What's the next step? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, anyway. <laughs> so she actually spends a while try going through a couple different ways of approaching step one. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, rejoicing in these things. It's not meant to be sentimental or trite. It actually takes guts. Each time we drop our complaints and allow everyday good fortune to inspire us, we enter the warrior's world. I have to tell you, and as somebody... <laughs> I'm just going to talk about myself a lot. Sorry, guys. Um, as somebody with, like, issues with depression, anxiety, it really does take quite a lot of effort sometimes to step away from that, like, that that self-inflicted, not almost self, not self-inflicted. What word am I looking for? There's a word for it of, like, where you're kind of whipping yourself. What am I thinking? Modulation. Of? Yeah, that one. <laughs> That's the word. Mm -hmm. and so um to get away from that long enough to start seeing my everyday good fortune and i think it sounds silly but is in fact a very real thing of how difficult it can be and how like you think ah oh, everybody wants the good things everyone's the happy things but your brain will fight you on this for some reason sometimes at least my brain will if you guys don't have that fight, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> because I have this fight. And I have to I have to pry my brain away from being like, no, I'm I'm thinking about the thing that's sad right now. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm busy. I am thinking about everything that could potentially go wrong on my <laughs> this this weekend or the next week of like how I'm probably gonna die of a seizure. Like <laughs> Yeah. Um, but no like having the bravery even to let go of that and say hey if I can let go of this I'm going to only benefit because the reality is gra grasping onto it I isn't increasing my control of the situation it mm -hmm. isn't fixing it <laughs> and ha being brave enough to say it's okay to let go because I'm already out of control like and be in approaching that reality and accepting it does take a lot of bravery so anyway, that's my feelings on that. I agree. Ooh. Oh, and then what does she say? Where is the paragraph? Here we go. So this is the second stage, and she starts talking about that. And then I highlighted this in my book because I thought it was good. Uh, the point is to find our spontaneous and natural capacity to be glad for another being, whether it feels unshakable or fleeting. So um, going back to my students as a reference point of how frustrating I find them. Uh, sometimes it's easier. Like I spend half the day going, you know what? I really, you know, I really believe in these students and they're going to they're going to do great. And then sometimes that feeling is very fleeting and goes away very fast. And does not last most of the day. <laughs> and I'm like, these little turds are uh, all going to fail. I won't fail. They probably won't fail my class, but they're all going to fail. <laughs> and I try not to feel that way. I'm probably making myself sound like a terrible teacher. And I do apologize. I mean, you're, you're talking about your own, like... Um anxieties and issues and stuff with teaching so that's these are my inside I, feelings I, yeah. I i do not speak these things to the students these are my personal yeah. desk feelings only for I this don't think they're like extrapolating from there to assume that you just completely don't do your job or anything like that <laughs> rather it implies the opposite <laughs> that if by thinking about these things you are in fact caring about your job and that's an important first step to being a good teacher i think <laughs> Also, I mean, the fact that you're telling us 
Like, and you're also acknowledging, like, you don't endorse these thoughts. Like, no, you don't I don't think they're stand good. behind them. No. Everybody has these thoughts. Specifically about your kids. About my students in particular. <laughs> yeah, I have never met them, but I know they're little shits in my brain. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I, I feel this way driving more often than not. Like, yeah. Um, and I, I, I can endorse them, but everybody feels these ways. And, um, I, I mean, I'm sure there's some perfect person out there who doesn't, but this is about dealing with that shit. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Okay. Youth pastor. Yeah. Youth pastor Max. (laughs) In my, in my art class, there are some of the meanest teenagers that don't even know they're being really mean. (laughs) There's all this like sort of start crap talking to teachers. Even if it's, like, somebody who the teacher might be friends with, and it's just, like, weird to me. Yeah. Like, why are you crap-talking their friends? You wouldn't do that to one of your friends. Like, I, I find... Or even, like, when the teacher is in the room, they'll start crap-talking them. There's, like, a separation in a lot of teenagers' minds where teachers are not humans. Um, <laughs> they are functioning as part of this organism that is the school. But beyond that, they are not individuals. They are not people. They're not, they don't have feelings the same way. And so I am often frustrated, but not surprised by the way that the students will speak to or about teachers. It is interesting how little theory of mind human beings have until they're about 25. Yeah. Our brains. You know, I tangently, I I am shocked as a species we were capable of making it this far given how little development it feels like our brains get for a whole entire quarter of a century. Like, <laughs> And even then, at 31, I'm still shocked at how much my mind is still changing. Like, I thought I'd done it at 26 or something. I was like, oh, wow, look how much I've really figured out stuff. I'm such a more well-rounded human. I... You're never done. And then, wow, now I'm still looking back going, wow, I really (laughs) screwed up sometimes in my 20s. But every five years brings just new new brain powers. Wait, Wait until we're in our, like, 50s. We'll be unstoppable. Yeah, we'll be unstoppable. <laughs> we'll achieve enlightenment, boys. We'll be up there someday. <laughs> I'm sorry you have so much further to go, Cell. We'll be there before you, but we'll let you know how it is. Mm-hmm. We'll we we'll pave the way for you. Oh, well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're fine. This is a good mentality. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, what can we do? Be mad? <laughs> There's nothing to do about it. It just is. That's called acceptance. Thanks. Thanks, Youth Pastor Max. Thank you, Youth Pastor Max. Thank you, Youth Pastor Max. You're welcome, children. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And then, I don't know why she did this, and she's just like, the next three stages. Like, she took all this time on the first and second stage, and then she's like, these are all the same. (laughs) <laughs> the next three stages um you know we become aware of our kind heart we open up we find rejoicing practice um i rejoice that henry won the lottery that would be let's see in my world that would probably be who's henry does she have good feelings for henry i have no idea rando rando won the lottery <laughs> Want to be happy for them. I I find it funny the idea of being mad someone won the lottery because I don't even try to win the lottery. So why would I? Actually, never... recently my mom got like 10k from the lottery. It Woo! turned out to be only 7,000, and then she decided to split it with her husband, so it ended uh, up being like 3,000. That's because taxes. Yeah. And she also decided to share a bunch of it with uh her husband. Uh, that was nice though. That still probably like helped them out quite a bit. Yeah. I rejoice that Sal's parents have lottery money now. I don't think they oh, have it anymore. Oh, that was like months ago. Oh, well. 
had lottery money. Yeah. Yeah. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> may, may we all have lottery money. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm going to do during my meditation. I'll breathe out lottery money to everybody. <laughs> That's that metal as hell. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really you start gonna... throwing up coins. <laughs> you won't even believe the uh, universal physics I'm going to have to break. <laughs> to make this happen for you guys, but I'll do it because I love you. <laughs> Thank you for making this oh. for us. I know that breathing out money is going to be painful. And <laughs> I might die during the process. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then she does a really good job of putting a very practical step of the world out. I think because sometimes. It's hard to get out of our heads, right? It's uh, take this moment of being like, why do I hold this grudge? If if it's not going to make me happy or ease my pain. Like, and just what I was talking about earlier where, you know, I my brain wants to sit in the fixation of anxiety when that doesn't give me more control of the situation or make it less likely to happen or anything. Mm -hmm. And so just, just taking these moments of really questioning motivations and whys and not just, you know, accepting that you're sitting in the sad times. I think that's, that's important. And then here's that thing I was talking about. Difficult people, as usual, the greatest teachers. This is true. This is a thing. Um, you know? They teach us yeah. how, how do we react to these things like envy, anger, fear, and revenge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyday, everyday emotions like cold, <laughs> hard revenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every Not day. all of us are, you know, as fucking hardcore as you, Des. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me just contemplate. We can't breathe money out, so... <laughs> You don't know. It could be. Um. Oh my gosh, what was the next part? Oh yeah. Then right on the spot, we can go beneath the words to the nonverbal experiences of the emotion. What's happening in our hearts, our shoulders, our gut? Abiding with the physical sensation is radically different from sticking to the storyline. It requires appreciation for this very moment. It's a way for relaxing. This whole little paragraph is pretty good, I think. Of getting out of the met metaphorical thought process and getting down to the nitty gritty of what's going on, and not just your body, your brain, you know, your body, your brain, and the situation and stuff. My brain body. Yeah, your brain body. Everybody's got that. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Can we rejoice for all beings throughout time and space? Find out on the next exciting episode. <laughs> Dragon Ball Z. Of Dragon Ball Z. Blue eyes, white dragon. And if you keep doing the good stuff, um, and 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 becoming a better human being, we may come to the point where we see the magic of the present moment. We may gradually wake up to the truth that we have always been warriors living in a sacred world. Hashtag goals. That's pretty, pretty sick. It's definitely, I want that. I want that in my life. Pretty I would like to, to wake up to this truth. Um, I like that we're all like, hell yeah. <laughs> hell yeah, Pima. Rock on. <laughs> and then she tells a little story. Uh, about a fox and the fox taught her some sad things but ultimately good things and no matter how shut Death down we done. get we can always look outside our cocoon and connect with joy Woo! and that was chapters 9 and 10 great work everybody but especially Das who talks the most I do. I talk quite a bit. Does do. <laughs> uh, 
Um, th any final comments regarding the content for today's chapters? It was very pleasant. Um, my favorite part was the teeth. Yeah. 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 Feeling called out? <laughs> Only a little bit. Gonna go scrub some vegetables later? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was gonna do that anyway, but... <laughs> <laughs> You don't know what you do for fun on the weekend. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's very enjoyable. Her, her, her way, her? She? Yeah, I'd Pim as a woman, I believe. Yeah. Uh, her way of um, instructing is always very straightforward and nice and pleasant and solid stuff. Yeah. I like her writing style. It's good. Yeah. Well, okay. 